Welcome to this Jeremy Bamber and White House Farm podcast. In this episode, we first discuss how the police were disinterested in asking Jeremy Bamber any questions related to the killings during his six days of police interviews in September 1985. We then move on to ask what really happened in White House Farm between the evening of 6th of August 1985 and the discovery that all five occupants had died the following morning. It has been the subject of much guesswork by many over the years. Scenarios have been created by authors and filmmakers based on nothing more than their imaginations, speculation and limited research. Today, for the first time, we bring you the most factual assessment of what we believe may have happened based on the evidence contained in the disclosed case material. Between the 8th and the 13th of September 1985, Jeremy Bamber was taken in for questioning following Julie Mugford's allegations to the police about his involvement in the murders. During his lengthy interviews, without a solicitor present, he was never asked a single question in relation to any details about the shootings and what had happened during the incident. You would have thought had Jeremy been a serious suspect, they would have pushed him to provide answers to questions regarding how he got to the house, what happened in the house, what time he arrived, how he left, the order of deaths, and the explanation as to why he did this. And yet they asked none of these questions. They asked nothing of this nature. While it may seem strange the police were not curious, it actually makes sense from their point of view, as they had no idea how the shootings occurred and therefore could not be suggestive in their questioning of Jeremy Bamba. This was owing to the fact that the shootings had not been investigated with any rigour and the police had believed all along that it was a case of murder and suicide. The crime scene had been disturbed repeatedly. Forensic evidence, including carpets and bedding, had been burnt by the police. The bodies had been cremated or buried, and the relatives had admitted ransacking the house for items of value. Jeremy's police interviews focused on four main topics. His relationship with various members of his family, financial matters, his relationship with Julie Mugford, and he faced repeated questioning about his telephone call to Chelmsford Police Station. Apparently to Essex Police, these issues were more important than asking him why he shot the family, or how he persuaded his sister to step over his dead mother's body, calmly lie down, and allow him to shoot her. Although the police seemed disinterested about these fundamental issues, here we offer an explanation of what happened on the evening of the 6th of August and the early hours of the 7th of August, 1985. This is based on research conducted by Yvonne Hartley and Jeremy Bamber. Evidence comes from detailed assessment of millions of pages of police documents, statements and new forensic evidence from scientists. Before we begin, it is important to state that contrary to what Essex Police and the prosecution argue, the facts show that a silencer was not fitted to the rifle and a silencer was never a factor in the events. Therefore, we do not include its involvement in the scenario. The actual sequence of events will never be known, as everyone involved in this tragedy died during the incident. But what we can present is the most likely scenario based on disclosed evidence. In the early evening, Neville, June and Sheila were sitting at the kitchen table discussing the future care of Nicholas and Daniel, Sheila's six-year-old twin sons, and the issue of them returning to foster care featured in this conversation. This was a conversation Jeremy overheard when he went into the house to gather a rifle to shoot rabbits he had seen earlier on the farm. Jeremy didn't see the children, and so it is assumed they must have been in bed. After his failed attempt to shoot the rabbits, Jeremy went back into the house, removed the magazine from the rifle, removed a bullet from the breech, put the rifle and the magazine on the wooden settle next to some Wellington boots and went back to work, collecting the harvested crops from the fields. At 9.30pm, the farm's secretary, Barbara Wilson, 
telephoned the farm and spoke to Neville. She gave evidence that, whilst we were speaking on the phone, I felt that his answers were abrupt and, and very short. He was very curt and sharp and had no return conversation with me. Normally we were quite chatty together, but this time everything was just yes and no. The telephone call ended with him saying, Cheerio, and that was that. I thought to myself that something was wrong. I felt other people were with him and that perhaps I'd interrupted an argument. Jeremy carried on working for a short time before leaving the farm at approximately 9.45pm. Having told his dad, there was just one more load of rapeseed which had been harvested that day to bring into the barn. Jeremy drove the three miles to his cottage in Goldhanger in his silver Astra. At 10pm, June's sister Pamela Bowflower telephoned the farm. Pam spoke briefly to Sheila, who only gave her yes and no answers and sounded zombie-like. Sheila then stopped talking altogether. June then spoke to Pamela and told her Sheila was just going off to bed. The sister's conversation was about Sheila's health and arranging a visit in the coming days and lasted approximately 20 minutes. At the same time that June was on the telephone, Neville was seen by Len Folks, a farm worker who gave evidence at about 10pm that evening, or just after, Mr Bamber came to the rape field on the tractor and picked up a trailer load of rapeseed and drove off up Pages Lane back to the farm. At around the same time as this, at Head Street, Jeremy made his usual evening telephone call to his girlfriend, Julie Mugford. He said that he'd had a pleasant enough day on the farm and had a general conversation. The call lasted about 20 minutes and after having some food and watching TV, Jeremy went to bed at about 11pm. Back at the farm, once June's phone conversation ended and Neville finished the last job of the day, June would have set the table in readiness for breakfast, as was her normal routine before going to bed. Evidence of this can be noticed in the crime scene photographs of the kitchen, in which plates, cereal bowls and cutlery for the family had been laid out. Neville remained downstairs, as according to his niece, Jacqueline Pargeter. It was his normal practice at the end of work to go into the lounge and sit in his own chair when he would enjoy a cigarette and a gin and tonic. During the times I stayed at White House Farm, I've often gone into the lounge and seen my uncle fast asleep in his chair. It seems likely that 61-year-old Neville, as he had so many times before, had fallen asleep in his favourite chair following a long day reaping the harvest. Upstairs photographs show that Sheila had not got into bed. As the police later discovered, that of the two beds in the room Sheila used, one had numerous personal items on top of it, whilst the other appeared unslept in. It is likely that Sheila couldn't settle, thinking issues over in her mind of how her hopes of getting back with Colin were destroyed when he introduced her to his new girlfriend a few days before, and how when Colin drove her to the farm three days earlier, he said that he was applying for full custody of the children. Sheila must have realised that her contact with the children was going to be minimal, with them in the full-time care of Colin. Added to this was the information we obtained from Pamela Bowflower's statement. She recalled, June told me that she'd been trying to persuade Sheila to take a holiday in a home at Bournemouth. The suggestion of foster care and a probable fear of having to uproot and go to a home far from her own apartment in London probably destabilised Sheila's fragile state of mind. This is a reasonable conclusion, because these changes may have led Sheila to extreme and irrational thoughts at a time when evidence shows a huge reduction of her antipsychotic medication, possibly amounting to withdrawal. We also know that she only had trace medication in her system, and this may have resulted in the trigger for the devastating events which followed. From this point on, we can only guess the version of events based on the scene, as it was found when the raid team entered the house at 7.35am on the 7th of August, 1985. But this is what the evidence indicates might have happened. Waiting until the house was silent and with June sleeping, 
Sheila came downstairs in the early hours of the morning, knowing her dad was likely to be asleep in the lounge. Perhaps she was hoping to continue talking to Neville about her future and the foster care concerns. Maybe what was on her mind also was that she did not want to be sent away again. Sheila knew the one person who she could talk to, who would be able to tell her everything was going to be all right and to reassure her was her dad. It seemed logical to suggest that when Sheila woke Neville from his sleep in the chair, they moved into the kitchen to discuss matters further. Perhaps they sat at the kitchen table. The police photographs show that the Arga was on and therefore the kitchen would have been heated. It is possible that the discussion fluctuated between irrational to calm frequently and likely escalated into a continuance of the previous argument, which led Sheila to grab the rifle from the settle and the magazine from the counter before running upstairs. By now it was almost 3.15 in the morning and it was at this stage Neville rang Jeremy to tell him that Sheila had gone crazy and had hold of a gun, but at no time in the brief exchange with Jeremy did Neville say it had been fired. Could the phone have then gone dead because Neville heard shots fired upstairs? Did he make his way to one of the two functioning staircases to see what was happening? We will never know. But at 3.26am the situation had worsened to the point where Neville telephoned the police. Although Neville did not state anything about shots being fired during this call, he did say his daughter had gone berserk and has got hold of one of my guns. He must have known police help was needed as a matter of urgency. This explains how, when Jeremy tried repeatedly to call his dad back, the phone was now engaged. The evidence is that Sheila did not know how to use the rifle. She had been around guns all her life. She had been on shooting holidays and had taken part in target practice with Jeremy in the past. The evidence now reveals that more shots were fired than Essex police disclosed. But this aside, the magazine for the rifle had a 10 bullet capacity and would have needed to be reloaded at least twice. Though boxes of bullets were on the kitchen worktop, as can be seen in the crime scene photographs, it is unknown if Sheila went to the kitchen to reload each time it was necessary, or if she carried bullets around with her. It is certainly possible that she put bullets in the bandolier discovered draped over the balustrade on the staircase. It is equally as possible she scooped up the bullets into a plastic bag, like the one seen in the crime scene photographs on the main bedroom floor, where unfired rounds of ammunition were also found. It has always been concluded that Sheila shot the boys first as they died in their sleep. But children can easily sleep through noise without being disturbed, so this conclusion can only be reached by supposition. Although it is possible that a whole different sequence of events took place, we will assume that the children were shot first, as there is nothing in the evidence to undermine this. It must be taken into consideration that this was a frenzy and everything happened within a very short space of time. Did the sound of the children being shot wake June, who had taken her regular sleeping pills prior to bed? Or was she asleep when she was first shot? Certainly bullets were later discovered in the pillows and blood was found on the bedding. It is known that at some stage June got out of bed after being shot. Essex police and the prosecution have always maintained Neville received some of his injuries upstairs, which would have rendered him incapable of telephoning Jeremy. The evidence, as it is now known, proved this did not happen. We believe that after his brief call to the police ended, Neville began to make his way up the main staircase, where we believe he received his first gunshot injury before going back into the kitchen. None of Neville Bamber's blood was found in the bedroom, and detailed examination of the pathology reports, photographs and x-rays now reveal that June and Nicholas received more gunshot injuries than were set out by the police and that all the cartridge cases found upstairs could be explained from the deceased found in both bedrooms. Was Neville ordered to retreat, or did he run? Was Sheila screaming in rage? We don't know. But once in the kitchen, 
already having sustained at least one gunshot injury. Although we cannot be sure of the order he received them, Neville must have tried to fend off her attack, as he had scratch marks and defence injuries on his arms. One of Sheila's earrings was torn from her ear, the back of which lodged in the fabric of her nightdress, and the front bead fell onto the kitchen floor underneath the table. Sheila, however, fired a succession of shots from the semi-automatic rifle, inflicting a total of eight gunshot injuries to Neville, who slumped the floor dead. Neville was later discovered by the first members of the raid team to be in a different place than where the crime scene photographs later showed and was not initially propped on a chair, but as stated by firearms officer P.C. Rosger. I looked just around the door and saw an overturned chair. Next to this chair, against the wall, was the body of a male, who I now know to be that of Mr. Neville Bamber. Crime scene photographs of the kitchen taken on that day show Neville propped precariously on an overturned chair, with a pool of blood directly below him and his head in a coal scuttle. Neville's blood was only present in one area of the kitchen, indicating that he was shot where he died and that this had happened quickly. Therefore, the police scenario of a huge struggle occurring between Neville and his assailant simply did not happen. Yes, there was some disturbance to the table and items were discovered on the floor, but this could easily have happened after Neville's death when Sheila fled to escape the raid team, or by the police as they rushed around the house looking for Sheila. We certainly know there weren't any scratches on the underside of the shelf that day, and no silencer was on the weapon, as the Crown had insisted. At some stage during the attacks, June had managed to get out of bed and had stumbled confused and wounded around her bedroom. Evidence from the crime scene photographs showed drops of blood all over the bedroom floor. Blood, which when tested, proved to be June's. Sheila's body was found prone on top of some of these blood drops, so clearly June had been in that area of the room prior to Sheila shooting herself. The evidence now supports that Sheila made her way back upstairs. Perhaps she heard June moving about, crying, calling for help, but reloading the magazine. Sheila made her way back upstairs. There is photographic evidence which reveals Sheila suffered numerous injuries consistent with being in a fight. Injuries which the Crown have tried to hide under layers of non-disclosure. However, gouges on Sheila's arms appear to have been most likely made by fingernails. Jeremy Bamber was not seen to have any injuries at all on his face, body or arms to indicate he had been involved in any form of struggle. No marks were seen by any of the police officers who saw him continually from shortly prior to 4am that day, nor were any marks or bruises seen by any of the relatives or Julie Mugford. June had handprints in blood all over her body and on her throat, and at the post-mortem was found to have sustained a black eye. Sheila had a clear handprint on her nightdress consistent with being grabbed from behind and a mark from her necklace on her throat. Ultimately, June sustained more gunshot wounds and fell to the floor in the main doorway of the room before being shot between the eyes. It was at this time that Sheila probably made her way back to the kitchen where she unleashed an attack on Neville with the stock of the gun, creating severe post-mortem injuries to his face and head. We know that Sheila must have heated the end of the barrel of the rifle on the hot arger, inflicting burn marks to Neville's back. Why she carried on her attack after he had died, we will never know. But perhaps she was then angry at Neville for not helping her. Could she have been blaming him for her actions, perhaps? Sheila was very close to Neville and may have blamed him for the events, as he had not discouraged the discussion regarding foster care or Sheila going into a residential home again. At 3.30am, Jeremy telephoned his girlfriend, Julie Mugford, to tell her about the worrying call from his father. Julie, who had been smoking marijuana with our housemates, simply told him to go back to bed. 
By 3.36 a.m., Jeremy was on the phone to the police to report the information he had been given by his father about the unfolding events. But the evidence strongly suggests that by the time Jeremy made this call, his mother, father and nephews were dead. Jeremy was instructed to meet the police at the scene. The police arrived at the scene at approximately 3.55am, with Jeremy arriving a couple of minutes behind them. The police detailed that at that time, the lights were all on in the house. When Jeremy Bamber accompanied two police officers on a recce of the house a few minutes later, all three saw a figure move in the main bedroom window, which caused them to run back to the police car, where a situation report and a request for firearms was made. Throughout the morning, lights were going on and off and curtains were opening and closing in the house. We know the police were in conversation with someone from within the house at 5.25am and that a 999 emergency call was made from inside the house at 6.09am. The evidence shows that the rifle later seen on Sheila's body was seen by two trained firearms officers in the window of the box room, situated next to the main bedroom where Sheila was later discovered dead. The evidence shows that items of clothing and cushions are on the kitchen floor, on top of Neville's blood. Did Sheila put them there? Did she sit next to her dad at some stage? This certainly would explain why a male and female were seen in the kitchen. So what did Sheila do next? The house was surrounded with armed police. It would have been noisy and completely different from the normal stillness of a summer evening. She may have seen the blue lights flashing on the many police cars at the scene. She may have heard the sirens, police radios and the dogs barking. Did she peep from the windows? It is known she was certainly upstairs when she put the rifle in the box room. Did she wash? Could that explain why her hands and feet may have been cleaner than expected, but still had blood on them? Did she sit in the children's room or mother's room reading passages from the Bible? It is certainly known that the Bible had multiple fingerprints on it and was covered in blood. Is this when she wrote a suicide note described by D.S. Jones in 2002, which said, I've just killed myself. Or did she remain with her dad for the majority of the time, sat on the cushions on the floor? As we stated earlier, we know that at 6.09am, Sheila made a 999 emergency call, which is set out on the police logs and was discovered in 2002 by the Metropolitan Police. Did she say anything on this call? Did she say she had shot her family? Did she say she was going to kill herself? We cannot say for sure because it remains undisclosed, but she must have indicated ambulances were needed as a few minutes later, two were ordered to attend the scene. Had the police forced entry to the locked and bolted house at this stage, it is possible that they could have saved her life. Whatever the sequence of events after the family had all died, we do know that by 7.30 a.m., Sheila was definitely in the kitchen. We believe that as the raid team smashed down the kitchen door with a sledgehammer and entered the house, Sheila fled upstairs. She ran along the hallway, through the children's bedroom, and grabbed the rifle from the box room window. Then she collected the Bible left out earlier, perhaps to give her some kind of solace, and entered the main bedroom. This is where she sat on the floor, in a semi-prone position, next to her parents' bed, with her shoulders against the bedside table and fired a single fatal suicide shot. <laughs>